Now, when it comes down to things like leaving all behind, uh, I've talked about this in terms of possessions and families and everything. You have to let the Holy Spirit do it in your mind. You have to let the Holy Spirit unwind you, <coughs> unwind the screw from the oak board. You can't go in there with a hammer and just try to pull it out. And you can't, there's no way that you can tug on that thing and get a screw out of a board of oak without a lot of turns. There's going to be turns. That's the kind way in the sense that if you were hurled into reality, that would be frightening if you would believe you were an ego. But if you're unwound from that, and you do that by getting into your purpose. And you and I have talked about that. You, you get shut out of your yoga class, you go in your car and cry, but the song comes on from Rihanna and you know, you, you boom, that's permission to let all your emotions up. Then you feel really good in that car after you've let those emotions up. That's the process of turning, turning, turning the screw. It's letting the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. Now, everyone's seeming journey in this journey is individualized, so it's highly individualized. So it's not a cookie cutter approach. We can't just go to the manual and go, okay, here we are. Okay, children, wife, you know, mother, you know, this and this and that. Where do we go from here? Well, turn to section 47 to find out how to get out. It's going to be moment by moment, but it's going to be out of purpose. And you should also know that you're not the first. There's actually a book a student of mine had from years ago from India, Deep Spiritual Traditions of India, of women who were in the situation that you're describing, who took the journey with the Spirit and unwound out of that. Much like Siddhartha, much like Jesus and Nazareth and so forth. It's not about trying to find a form solution either. You know, when people try to walk out of very stressful situations or very stressful relationships, if they don't really let the Holy Spirit guide them out, which is the turning of the screw, they will find themselves in situations that have the very same uh, emotions going on and the same difficulties, but different faces and different places. So there is no geographical cure for this and there is no just automatically, I'll just, I'll just switch partners, I'll switch. Uh, people have tried to just leave the form behind and what happens is it just shows right up back in their face again because the mind is that powerful and you don't ever escape from going from one form into the next. You, you escape by letting the Holy Spirit give you the guidance of what to say, what to do, where to go, and, and literally take you step by step by step where you're doing your mind training every step of the way and your, your really prayer of your heart is what will serve the whole universe? What will bring a blessing to the whole universe? What is in the highest good of the entire universe? And Jesus does say in the workbook that everything you think and say and do teaches all the universe. Talk about family constellations, how about cosmic constellations? How about, not only on this planet, we'll say there's seven billion people, but this planet is one tiny aspect of this galaxy. And there are other inhabited planets in this galaxy, and there are other inhabited planets on many, many galaxies. We have a very little narrow swath, thinking the human condition is like the center of the, the cosmos, very much like the, the people of generations before really believed that the, the sun, uh, the earth was the center of the universe and the sun revolved around the earth until Copernicus came along and said, no, it's not that way. You know, and everything got turned, got flipped over. We think in terms of human terms, so when we're thinking of our major decisions in life, like whether to follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit or not, we're thinking, well, Aunt Edna's not going to be pleased, uh, right away. <laughs> She's going to say it's a sect, it's a cult, you've, you've gone bonkers. And you write her off right away, because she's going to definitely, and then, well, how's my mom going to react, my dad going to react, how's my children going to react, how's this going to, how are my neighbors you know, going to react. We're not talking about putting on robes and going out and saying that you're Jesus Christ, or anything like that. We're just talking about the basics of giving your heart over to the Spirit and saying, guide me in a practical way. 
there's still going to be that guilt that's coming up, as if you're going to be letting someone down. The ego has set up family constellations as part of a false identity. So, how does this work? Well, there's the person that you seem to be who you are, that's very much a part of the ego false identity. Once you believe you're a body, instead of an eternal being. And then, it surrounds that body in the projection with other bodies. We could call family bodies, friend bodies, neighbor bodies, <coughs> colleague bodies. There's all these, that's all part of this self-concept. And what, why are these figures that are around the dream figure so important is because they're part of a false identity. And this is a make-believe little tiny identity compared to the whole cosmos. And it's, it's overly, seen as overly important by the ego because, because the ego says, you know, you aren't worth much as a person. You know, you're shameful as a person, you're guilty. Maybe you can make a few handful of friends and have some important people in your life to make yourself feel a little more worthwhile. You know, to boost your self-esteem up just a little, so you won't feel so bad. And that little constellation is extremely important to the ego. Then, outside of that constellation, if you go a little bit further, you find your community. Like your community, if you live in a village, or if you live in London, if you live in England, or wherever you live, that's part of the constellation too. And, you know, you get together with them and occasionally rub elbows and the, the Olympics come, you go, Hey, we're hosting the Olympics and yeah, we have camaraderie, you know, and we're going to go out and we're going to compete against the world. Let's root for the Brits, you know, and come on, let's do it. And, you know, you have, you have a bit of a, a relationship with your fellow, you know, Brits, but the thing about it is that's just an outer layer outside that important special family and friends. They're out there. And then you get other people, maybe other Europeans, and this and this. But basically, if we cut to the chase, you're basically indifferent to most of the seven billion. You really don't care. Okay. Nuclear bomb went off and all of Australia was destroyed. It's too bad. Pass the butter. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you know it, it, it wouldn't be such a big threat unless the terrorist found a way to launch and, and explode a new nuclear device over London. Now it's getting a little close <laughs> for comfort. Like, hmm, hmm, they got Australia, but, <laughs> but you know, it's a try that one, and then it, the fear level starts to rise up, because it's a little too close for comfort. To, the, to what? To the little body that you believe you are, and to the little constellation that's around that body. Why? Because they're special to the, to the ego. They're more special than the other seven billion. In the end, you know, if it's, if it's World War III and all of everything gets wiped out, except Manchester. It's the only place left to go in the whole world. It's Manchester. Suddenly Manchester is looking pretty good. And I'm glad I got a house in Manchester. Looking pretty good, because if you wipe out the rest of the planet, then this ego will go, Manchester is like, the head, it's the, it's the central place in the universe you know, <laughs> to the ego, you know. But but this is how it works. So when you start to unwind from the self-concept, which is when you get to the back of the book, the text, he's got his self-concept versus self section. He will say things like, "Salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts," and he's talking about really all the concepts because. Our concepts about the black holes and the other galaxies are no different than our concepts of our personality self, or mom or dad, or children, or aunts and uncles, nieces, nephews. They're all the same. There's no hierarchy of illusions. That star way out there in that unnamed galaxy that just has been discovered is the same as a child. It's the same as a parent. A concept is a concept. When Siddhartha opened up to the Buddha, but he said, let go of it all. Empty your mind of every concept that you hold. He didn't say, and keep a few behind that are precious to you. He said, empty your mind entirely. And that's what Jesus is saying. Some of you remember that when you get into the workbook. He says, simply do this, be still. Lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, all concepts that you hold Everything that you've learned from the past, hold on to nothing. Forget this world, forget this course, and come with open arms unto your God. 
It's a beautiful passage of the same thing that Buddha was teaching. Same thing. Same thing that all the masters teach, you know. Empty your mind of the contents of consciousness. And the ego doesn't like that at all. Especially if you get too close to its little make-believe self-concept. Because then it's saying, now that's really pushing it. You know, you're, you're actually starting to question things that, are, that the ego says are, are very, very dear and that should never be questioned. But these are kind of relationships that you're supposed to take to your grave. You're supposed to go and die with these relationships, you know. And, and th that means that loosening from that, unwinding that screw is going to, it will take a lot of practice because there are no hierarchies of illusions and there's no order of difficulty in miracles. There are some great stories from back in the day when, when Jesus, opened up to being the Christ, suddenly mom was no longer mom. How could she be in, in that? Suddenly everyone was brother, everyone was sister, everyone shared the same agape love. There were no special people. It's not like, you know, oh, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, oh, stop, mom's here. Hey mom, how you doing? You know, this and this. And, what was it, where was I? Blessed or something, I forgot. <laughs> Distracted there. No, he he doesn't stop for mom. He doesn't stop for for dad. He doesn't stop for anything. The, the love keeps pouring through, but it's it's universal. So let's take a little closer look at it. Let's use the concept of mom, for example. You can pick one, mom or wife. I can take either one apart. So the wife concept is is an ego concept. God didn't create it. It's an invention. It's fiction. And when you identify with it, it, to the ego, it has benefits and drawbacks. Uh, and yet, to the spirit, it has no benefits whatsoever, because it's blocking your awareness of being the Christ. So, I'll call it an ego ideal, okay? We'll call the wife an ego ideal. It's, if we got into just idealistic thinking, and people do this, they'll talk to me about ideals and idealistic, they'll say, They'll talk about the wife and what's, they'll say, what, what is a perfect wife? They say, no, there's no, there is no such thing as a perfect wife. So let's leave that out of the ideal. But we still can talk in ideal terms of a good wife. What's the definition of a good wife? Has anybody ever tried to live up to that one here? Has anyone given that a run around? Yeah, you can speak from experience. It's an ego ideal. And you see how the ego plays that card to get you feeling guilty. It's the same as a good mother, a good son, good daughter, good husband. It's the same thing. It's an ego ideal. And you try to live up to this ideal in your mind. And you try to do all the right things, make all the right moves, say all the right things, have the right attitudes, the right demeanor, do the, all the stuff for the good wife package. And, and there's various models in different cultures, you know, different cultures, you know, if you get to the Middle East, the good wife probably uh, has to wear a veil. And there's all kinds of rituals about not being able to be looked at by a man or touched, and it varies by culture, but you probably could come up with a good wife package for every culture, you know. And every culture, every good wife experiences guilt. For what? For not living up to the ideal. Isn't that a sneaky trick? The ego makes the ideal and tells you that you are that ideal and then you never can live up to the ideal. You, you never, in fact it'll move the bar. You'll be, I'm super wife. Yeah, I, can, I bring home the bacon, I cook the bacon, I clean the bacon, I do everything. I'm a super wife. And the ego goes, not good enough. That's still not going to qualify in its category because what? It's an artificial construct. How can you be a good, good wife? Are you ever a good enough wife? That's the question that the ego doesn't want you to ask because it wants to keep up this good enough game going so that you'll forever keep trying to reach the standard and forever be guilty. So this is why I would say as you go on this journey, you, you start to question these concepts very sincerely, because you start to realize there's guilt involved in them. But the Holy Spirit will unwind you from time and space. 
it's not like you can just go, okay, I'm, I'm just going to cross all these roles off in my mind. If you, if you had the willingness and readiness, then you could come close to that, but for most, it's much more of a gentle unwinding out of time and space. Not a shattering. Not like somebody takes a bazooka out and just, just shoots, starts gunning down all these things. It's not the way the Holy Spirit works. It's an unwinding. From, as you go deeper into these spiritual experiences, I'll call them mystical and miraculous experiences, you start to have expansive awarenesses that you're more than these ego ideals. I'm more than a wife, more than a mother, and everyone who's here knows that more than feeling. You know, it, it's in your heart. It, you know that there's something more than the roles that you've been playing. You know that there's something more than this world. The whole point is to try to tap into that vast experience, and that's really what forgiveness is about. But you can understand that that's part of the ego's manipulation again, is that it makes up a false world, it makes up false concepts and ideals, and then it tells you, you've left heaven and you're never going to go back, and the Spirit is never letting you back in. God will never let you back in heaven for what you did with the fall. And now you better make the best of these ego ideals, because you have no other alternative. This is what the ego is telling you. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about letting go of these things, because you know, it's basically the ego says, God will strike you, you know, you will, God will punish you if you come back. And again, the ego made up its own God, it made up a punishing God. And that's what a lot of us dealt with with our theologies. You know, God's, there's going to be consequences, there's going to be punishment. The real God doesn't even know what punishment is, doesn't even know the concept of punishment. But the ego is using this concept of punishment with a lot of manipulation to keep the mind from opening up in consciousness and being free of the ego.